Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter number 12 tonight, so if you have your Bibles, take them and turn with me to Acts chapter number 12. And the message tonight is, un- is entitled, Unrivaled God, Unrivaled God. And how many of you are thankful that we have a God that doesn't compare to any other, anything else? He's an unrivaled God. I was looking up the definition of that word, unrivaled. It means this, better than everyone or everything of the same type. Better than everyone or everything of the same type. And I was thinking, by that definition, this being Mother's Day, I think I have an unrivaled mother. I have a pretty awesome mom, and I'm proud of, uh, uh, to call her my mom. And I was thinking, man, I have an unrivaled mom. And I was writing some Mother's Day cards this morning, and I was writing a card to my wife, and I was writing in the card, you're the best mom in the world. And I, I had to pause, because I'm like, that is a reserve for my mom. I'm like, I, I really had to think about it a second. So it's a tie. Actually, now it's a tie between my wife and my mom. But everyone else doesn't compare. Unrivaled between the two of you. I asked my, mom, my uh, wife, help me, to, help me to understand, you know, how difficult it is to be a mom. I know it's a lot of work. But so she, she texted me some things this afternoon, and here's what she said. These, these are some thoughts from some moms. Uh, this first one says, my nickname is Mom, but my full name is Mom. Mom, Mom, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, uh, this next one, this is texting between two friends. Mom number one says, I'm done. I'm selling the kid on eBay. Mom number two says, don't be crazy. You made him. That goes on Etsy. <laughs> There's another one said, momster, noun. What happens to mom after she counts to three? <laughs> uh, someone said this, uh, mo- no cookie unless you have five bites of chicken. Okay, no cookie unless you have three bites of chicken. All right, I will give you the entire sleeve of cookies if you lick the chicken. <laughs> Someone said, my kids wanted to know what it's like to be a mom, so I woke them up at 2 a.m. to let them know my sock came off. <laughs> <laughs> and another mom said, my kids will rock, walk right past their father, sitting on the couch, come bang on the shower door for me to open a fruit snack. <laughs> and then I like this one. At bedtime... My children turn into dehydrated philosophers who need a hug. <laughs> so moms, thank you for, for all that you do. We are going to look at this passage, um, and we are going to look at the fact that our God is unrivaled. No one compares to God, nothing compares to God, and God will accomplish what God chooses to accomplish. And we, we are going to cover this whole chapter tonight, so we do need to move quickly. So for sake of time, I want to read the first verse. And then verse number 24. So Acts chapter number 12. And let's stand together and read these two verses. Uh, Acts chapter number 12. And verse number 1 says this. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And we'll, fill, we'll cover the rest of the passage in a moment. But verse number 24 says this. But the word of God grew and multiplied. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that no, no one, nothing compares to you. And we thank you that you are an unrivaled God. We, we thank you for what, you, what you've accomplished in Scripture and what you will accomplish in our lives and in the lives of our church family. And I pray that you'd help us tonight as we move through this passage of Scripture. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, as we come to this passage, it's helpful for us to understand that New Testament Christianity is still in its infancy, all right? This has only been about less than 10 years since Jesus Christ had been uh, uh, crucified and risen from the dead. So Christianity is still in its infancy, but it's spreading like crazy. It's spreading all around the region. Uh, The gospel is being shared. Churches are being planted. Missionaries are being uh, sent and persecution will soon come. And that's really what we find in this passage because we find that Herod stretches out his hands to persecute his church. We'll, con- we'll continue reading this passage in just a moment, but I think it's interesting that uh, as a church family, when we encounter difficulties, it's often nothing that the first century church didn't itself encounter. Okay, So we find in this passage a blueprint for when difficult times come, moments of uncertainty, what do we do? We can come to God's Word, and we can find the truths, and we can find what to do. And that's what we have in this passage. And there's a few things that happen in this passage to this uh, New Testament first century church that I believe we can, we can take note of, and we can uh, learn some lessons from, from this passage. The first thing that we see in this passage is that the wicked rise in opposition to God. 
the wicked rise in opposition to God. And that's the verse we read just a moment ago. Verse number one. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex. That word vex means uh, it's an intent to do evil. So Herod is going to intend to inflict harm, evil, pain, and suffering, certain of the church. So the wicked rise in opposition to God. Herod wasn't the first, and Herod wouldn't be the last, but Herod was the one at the time ruling in that area who decided to oppose the church and to afflict pain into the church. Now, Herod is a familiar New Testament name, and it can be a bit confusing because the Bible refers to Herod quite often and multiple times throughout even the book of Acts, but there were six different Herods. There were six different Herods represented in Scripture. It was, it was a big family, actually. It was the Herodian dynasty, okay? So the Antipater, the, the grandfather of the Herod that we're reading in this passage, he helped one of the Roman emperors at, at a time of war, and he lent his support during this time of war. And in return, this, this, this Herod, this grandfather, got a political office, okay? His son came and was Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the Herod uh, who ruled around the time of Christ. So Herod the Great was not a good guy, though. He was not a great king as, as far as being nice and friendly. He was great in that he was a great builder. And a few things that he built was, and I think we got some pictures of some of these. I don't know the order. This is uh, Caesarea, the port in Caesarea. If you have taken a tour in the Holy Land, this is often where you'll spend the first day. And Herod built this location. Masada is another location that Herod built, kind of like a retreat area. And <clears throat> Herod built this, among other things. And then most famously, Herod helped to rebuild the temple. And this would have been the temple that was standing around the time of Christ. So Herod was really a great ruler and a great builder, but he was a terrible person. Person. He was very suspicious of anyone who would try to get his throne. In fact, many of his wives and many of his sons' lives ended in death because Herod thought that they were out to get the throne. And so Herod was very suspicious. And, and, and uh, one of the emperors, I believe it was uh, Caesar Augustus, said that it was better to be one of Herod's pigs than Herod's sons. And so Herod was a really, really bad king. And uh, upon his death, the, the kingdom was, was split up. And we have Herod, uh, the Tetrarch, you've heard that term. That word Tetrarch means ruler of a quarter. So the kingdom is divided. And then there's a period of time where uh, the, it goes back to a Roman province. Okay, so There's 35 years where Israel has, has no Herod ruling. But then the Herod that we read of tonight comes back into power. Now, the Jews are happy about this because you know, if you know Scripture, you know that the Jews wanted a king, right? Okay, So they have this kind of love-hate relationship. And one of the things that the Herod family knew how to do, they knew how to cater to both sides. Okay, they, they really rode the fence well with Rome and the Jewish people. And they did well in this. And so they would practice the Jewish customs and they would observe the Jewish and they would really cater to the Jewish population. But at the same time, they would came, cater to the Roman leaders. And that's why a lot of the cities even... In, uh, in Israel are named, like Tiberius, uh, uh, named after the Roman emperor. And so the Herods would do this really well. So we have Herod, he's ruling here in, in, in the region, and he's, he's ruling, but he's, he's a wicked king. He's a wicked king, and, and, and it says that he stretches out his hand uh, to vex certain of, of the church. Now, why... Why would he do this? And, and the first thing we see in this passage is that, the, is that the church is targeted. So he stretches forth his hand. Now, why would he target the ch church with such cruel and evil intentions? And I think the simple answer is because the church was doing something. The church was focused on spreading the gospel, preaching the gospel. We see a church that doesn't have this sort of focus on, on preaching the gospel and telling others about Christ— that church is its own demise. The devil doesn't need to worry about a church like this. I think what frustrated the Jews and what frustrated Herod with the church was that the church was moving forward, okay? And as long as the church moves forward, there will be segments of society that aren't happy about the church moving forward because they're against the message and the cause of Christ. And that's what happens is that the church is targeted today. So this shouldn't surprise us when when rulers and legislators will vex against the church simply because the church is accomplishing what Scripture tells us to accomplish. See, Herod's issue wasn't really with Peter and James. It was really with the message that they preached. And, and so Herod is upset, and, and, and really we, that, that, uh, that frustration is seen played out in this first verse. It says that, uh, in verse number two, and he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. 
All right, so Herod means business. Now, James would have been the first apostle to die this martyr's death. Okay, so Jesus has, has died, but he's resurrected. Now the apostles are going around teaching and preaching. Uh, but now James is killed. And he's killed by the sword, meaning he's beheaded. Uh, there was a conversation that James and John had. Actually, their mother had with Jesus. When he asked, she asked if James and John could rule on Jesus' left and right side. Remember that? And Jesus says that they're not ready. They don't know really what, what's up. They're, they're not, uh, they're, you don't know the cup that I'm going to bear. And do you remember James and John? They said, we are ready. We are willing. This is what Jesus was talking about. He says, you will. And he he ensures them in Matthew chapter 20. He said that, um, uh, he said, ye shall indeed drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. And so Jesus predicted this. He prophesied that this day would come. And a day certainly came where James lost his life. So this is a reality check for the apostles. Because they are, they are facing violent persecution now. Lives are being lost. And Luke records that uh, James was killed with the sword, meaning he was beheaded. See, stoning or crucifixion was reserved for, for uh, the death of a criminal. Uh, beheading wasn't a common death. It was usually reserved for a traitor. And we, I don't know why Herod chose to uh, kill James in this way, but we do know the response of of the population there. The next verse tells us, in verse number 3, and because he saw it, pleased the Jews. And so we see that the church is targeted and the wicked approve. That's why sometimes as Bible believers, it boggles our mind. We try to make sense of like, why someone would, why a a legislator would would legislate against the church. And we think, you know, what does the church stand for? We put families back together and and, and God's grace and God's love is felt here. But but the, the, the wicked want to hear none of that, but the wicked will approve of this. And so the wicked approve when the church is targeted. Just a side note here, Herod acted for the approval of men. The Bible tells us that the approval of man is a snare. I don't know whether or not Herod would have done this, but he was surely motivated to continue his persecution in this passage based on the approval of what people were saying. And he acted upon the approval. And listen, we live in a society that sometimes will do things that is just ridiculous just for the approval of men. I was reading this past uh, week about how, how... Foolish accidents and pranks are on the rise because teenagers are doing foolish things, videoing themselves so they can post it on the internet. It's this, this, this craze to go, to go viral, uh, viral, 15 seconds of fame. They're actually hurting themselves, inflicting harm on themselves just to get the approval of everyone. We do foolish things sometimes for the approval of men, but the Bible says it's a snare, and this is a trap that Herod has fallen into. In verse number 4, we'll continue reading. It says, And when he had apprehended him... He put him in prison. This is, uh, this is Peter we're talking about. And delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Okay, so Herod kills James. Everyone applause. Herod likes this. He's living for the approval of man. So he goes and gets Peter. Okay, Peter is as good as dead, so Herod thinks. But he can't kill him yet because there's a high feast going on. And remember I told you that Herod will cater to the Jewish traditions and customs. So even though he wants Peter dead and he wants the satisfaction of that in his mind, he can't do that yet. He's got to keep him in prison. So what he does is he puts them in prison with a quaternion. This is 16 different guards. Okay, this is not normal. Normally, if you're a a, a prisoner under Roman rule, it'd be a one-to-one ratio, one prisoner for one guard. Okay, They would shackle you to the guard, your strong hand, or your weak hand, to the guard's strong hand. That's usually how it worked. But in Peter's case, he has 16 different soldiers who are assigned to him. Uh, These soldiers, uh, they would go in shifts, four at a time. Two would be uh, chained to him at any given moment, and then two would be outside on guard. So Peter is, is being guarded heavily. Now, is this overkill? Well, maybe for a normal prisoner, but... But Peter's been in prison before. In fact, in Acts chapter number 5, you can read, it says, when they laid their hands on the apostles and put them into a common prison, but the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors. But the officers came and found them not in prison. They returned and told them, saying, this is is funny to me, verse number 23 of Acts chapter 5, saying, 
the prison truly found we shut with all safety and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we opened it, we found no man within. That's funny to me that the angel of the Lord had already delivered Peter. The guards are saying, no, surely with all safety, we checked everywhere. The guards were still there. And, and this was bad for a prisoner, a guard. If, if a prisoner escaped, it often meant your life. And so Peter's already escaped. So Herod wants to make sure that this doesn't happen. And so he places these guards with Peter in and around the prison. We see this wicked rise in opposition to God. But what happens next is that the church responds in faith. So the wicked rise in opposition to God, that's going to happen in the society that we live in. That'll happen with more frequency. So what's our takeaway? What's our lesson? What's the pattern that we see here in Scripture? What do we get all, all distressed by this? What, what do we do in response to this? Well, let's see what the church did here. The church responded in faith. Verse number 5 says this, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So he's kept in prison, the Bible tells us. He's kept in prison. Every door is closed for him to get out there, but there's one door that's open, and that is the door of prayer. And the church family, they come together during this tumultuous time, and they said, listen, I don't know what we can do about Herod, and I don't know what we can do about this, but I know what we can do. We can come together, and we can pray steadfastly, as the apostles had been doing since Acts chapter number 2. We can come together, and we can pray. And that's exactly what they did. And they leave for us this pattern that I think we can learn from. See, just in this verse, we see that they prayed continually. It says they prayed without ceasing. You know, sometimes we pray, and it's just like a, a quick, you know, interjection before a meal or, or just, you know, when we happen to think of it. But this church got together and they prayed continually without ceasing. We also see that they prayed corporately. They came together. Something happens when God's church prays. Uh, one theologian said, a church is never more like a New Testament church than when it is praying. One of the most important things we can do as a church family is we can pray. And we can pray individually, and we should in pray individually, and we, and we should do that. But there is something special about coming together in prayer and bringing our petitions to God. It's what the church does. And so this church comes together, and they pray continually, they pray corporately, and they pray collect correctly because they pray without ceasing of the church, that's collectively, unto God. See, their prayers were directed to God, the, the uh, unrivaled deity in the universe you know, that, could, that could hear our prayers and respond to our prayers. They prayed correctly to God. How often do we voice our frustration, our frustration over the rising wickedness in our society without ever bowing a knee? And so here, and sometimes you turn on the news and you, you log on to social media and it's just like, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And, 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 and even we'll just talk about it throughout the day and we'll talk around it after church. But, but how often do we voice our frustration, and I'm guilty of this too, but then we don't bend our knee to pray. These believers, they bent their knee to pray. Herod stands before God. They bend their knee to bow before God. And they prayed to God. It's too bad that for many Christians, it takes an incarceration or a hospitalization to run to God in prayer. Now, God's there for us, and he's ready to hear our prayers and our petitions. But he's not just there when someone's in the hospital or when someone's in a, in a desperate situation. And I believe for this church, prayer was not just a 911 call. This was, this was part of the DNA of the church. This is why the church was thriving, because they were praying. Now, Peter's going to get out of prison. Spoiler alert. Peter will get out of prison. But James did not. I would imagine that they prayed for James with equal fervency. Would they not have? And yet James, his life ends tragically. So we might think, well, what, what good is prayer? What good does prayer do? Is it just therapeutic? It's not therapeutic. It's theological. Scripture commands us to pray, tells us to pray, and gives us the benefit. Let me tell you the, some of the benefits of prayer. First of all, prayer gives us access. Because 
of Christ, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Hebrews 4.13. All right, so that's the first thing. There's no sense in a desperate situation to go and talk to someone that can't do anything about it, right? So what prayer does, it gives us access to the person that can do something about it. Prayer not only gives us access, and, and, and 1 John 5.14 says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, that he heareth us. So God's going to hear our prayers. But prayer not only gives us access, prayer causes, and I think this is very important, we skip over this sometimes, prayer causes alignment. And Jesus provided the perfect pattern for us in Luke chapter 22 when he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, remove this cup, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. It's a pattern of alignment. And sometimes we'll go to God in prayer saying, God, can we just do this? Can we do this? And this is why we're commanded to pray in Jesus' name aligned to his will. Because sometimes what prayer does is not change what God was going to do, but change our perspective on the situation. There's an alignment. So there's prayer aligns us to God's will. It gives us access to God. And then prayer gives us answers. The Bible says, call unto me on the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. God does something when we pray. And whatever he does, sometimes we don't like the answer, but whatever he does according to this verse, it's for his glory. Call unto me, I'll deliver you. And he says, I'll do that for my glory. Now we don't understand sometimes how he answers prayers. The Bible says that, uh, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. We don't always know why um, God answers the way he does, but he does answer. And he answered for, Je- for Peter here, and he answered for James. Um, I don't, we don't really know exactly why. Sometimes uh, God will, will uh, answer a prayer request in a, in a certain way. We, we think of the prayers that have been made for Brother Harris, and we're so grateful for those. But, 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 but what, if, what about someone else that ended differently? Let, let me tell you this, that God is a loving God who hears our prayer, aligns us to his will, and he's going to accomplish his will for his glory. I'm thinking of the, the uh, witnesses who are testifying in Revelation chapter number 11. It says, When they finish their testimony, the beast descended out of the bottomless pit, uh, shall make war against them, shall overcome them, and kill them. So here's two witnesses testifying in Jerusalem. And when were they done? When were they killed? When did their lives end? When their testimony was finished. So I don't know why God allowed James' life to end when it did, but we do know that James' testimony was finished and God brought glory to God. It's kind of like if you've ever seen someone painting a picture and you have got a master. If you've ever seen that first, first coat that goes on the canvas, you can't make out what it is. And then you see the second coat and maybe you don't know what it is and, and even a good artist will come and, and you think you got it figured out and it'll come and smear it. But a, but a, but a masterpiece often is there's layers to it and there's, there's layers to it and then you see it come together. And let me tell you, God is working everything to his will. But we are commanded to pray, and when we pray, he hears and he moves. And so this church comes together, and they're praying. These believers are praying, and they're praying right. But, but what is Peter doing? I love this, because we find here in this next verse, Peter's resting. It says this, and when Herod would have brought him forth. Okay, so this is the moment, all right? Remember we said they're waiting for the high feast to, to finish, okay? Then Peter's dead. Okay, so the high feast is almost over. You think, you know, you and I were, might be like, this is my last moment, it's my last meal, I'm, you know, I'm getting a little antsy here. No, Peter's sleeping. All right, he's, how many of you know a sound sleeper? All right, I'm, I, I can be a sound sleeper. Sometimes my wife wake, wakes me up, I thought I heard something, don't worry, we'll be fine. Just trust God, it'll be, it'll be fine. I'm, I can be kind of a sound sleeper sometimes. So Peter, he's sleeping. Actually, this is not the first time we find Peter sleeping in prison. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter, again, remember, Jesus comes to him. He's like, can't you just like wait and watch for an hour and pray? And, and, and Peter couldn't do it. And so Peter, he, he's sleeping between two soldiers bound with chains and the keeper before the door. So imagine this. He's in a prison cell. It, it wasn't air-conditioned. It wasn't nice. He probably didn't have, he didn't have a mattress or anything. In fact, he's changed. He doesn't even have, he has an itch on his nose. Can't do anything about it. You know, he's just there. And he's sleeping. He's getting rest. I saw a report the other day, 2017 Newswire report, that the sleep industry is a $28 billion industry and growing. Uh, 58% of all Americans uh, say they have some trouble sleeping. And, and, and I realize some of those are, are even medical reasons, and I get that. But I'll tell you, the point is, we have trouble getting less rest. 
don't we? But God gives us rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So I believe this is a contributing factor to Peter's good night's sleep. He's there, he's sleeping. Why is he resting so, so well? He's resting in the promises of God. What promise of God? Well, at the very end of John chapter number 21, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. Now, Jesus is talking to Peter here. And he says this, But when thou shalt be old. Guess what? Peter's not old yet. So Peter knows he's good. He knows there's a promise here, and it's, it's something small, but he picks up on this. Jesus says, you're not going to die until you're older. Peter remembered that. He's like, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm good. I really believe that Peter's resting in the promises of God, and he's resting in the promises of God. And can I tell you something? We do have promises. Uh, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 24, verse 19, fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked. For there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. Guess what that means? We don't have to keep score because God is. God is unrivaled. He's got it all figured out. All we have to do is trust in him, rest in his promises, and, 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 and pray like this church is doing and have that real vibrant relationship with him, and it's going to be okay. We don't have to be stressed out and distressed about it. And so we find here in verse number 7 that... Peter's about to be delivered, and it says this, And behold, the angel of the Lord came, up, uh, came upon him and shined a light in the prison. Okay, so here it goes. The angel comes in the prison, maybe the same angel that came in Acts chapter number 5, and, and, and shines a light into the prison. Okay, so Peter would get up, but doesn't get up. How many of you guys, like me, I can't sleep with the light on, right? So I don't know how bright, I don't know how many watts angels are, okay? But <laughs> angel comes in, shines into the prison, it's bright, but Peter's still sleeping, okay? He's a sound sleeper, I told you. So then the angel comes and uh, says, and he smote Peter on the side. That's funny. He has to come, he has to, has to nudge him to wake Peter up and raise them up, saying, arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hand. So the wicked rise in opposition to God, but the church responds in faith, for the church, the believers who are hiding in a house, praying, that's the, they are expressing faith. And for James, he's expressing faith by just simply resting in the promises of God. And so he's, he's freed, the shackles, the chains fall from his hand. And we'll see this, and we're done. That in this passage, the gospel continues to advance. The gospel continues to advance. So Peter's released, but I want you to see this, verse number 8. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. Okay, so Peter is released, he's free, but he's still responsible. I thought this was interesting, because the angel says, Get up, put your clothes on, put your shoes on. Maybe, you know, moms like you do with your kids sometimes. So like, come on, come on, get up, get up. Lights on, clothes on, shoes on. This is what the angel's doing with Peter. And Peter's just groggy, like, getting dressed and everything. But I love this because it shows, see, the angel just magically appears, in the, not magically, God allows this angel to appear in the prison. They're going to escape through uh, be, by the doors being open. God could have ordained it to where Peter was just instantly on the outside of prison, but you know what God did? God, God instructed through the angel, Peter, put your shoes on. See, there's responsibility. There, there is, the, God works in miraculous ways, but that does not eliminate our responsibility. Let's get practical about this, Okay. God's going to work, but it doesn't mean that we don't have to do anything. Peter still had to put his shoes on, get dressed, get up, and go. And that's what he does. And verse number 9 says, And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. I love this. So Peter doesn't even know if he's awake. Okay? So he's like, he thinks maybe he's dreaming of the first time that it happened, and he goes and he doesn't even know if he's awake. Um, I mentioned, I, I've told you guys before, I have Blair, I have two daughters, Blair and uh, Layton, and we just um, adopted a third Alexa from Amazon, so we have Alexa, if you know Alexa, <laughs> and uh, she's not saved yet, okay? Um, so we have this little Alexa device that we can talk to, and like, it, it's supposed to obey us, but it's, it's like, we yell at Alexa, like, no, right now, Alexa, do this or do that, you know? And uh, she's always misbehaving, but I figured out how to, how to connect my Alexa to my television so we can tell Alexa to turn on the TV, and I was so excited about that until the 
that night, after I hooked Alexa and trained her how to do this, okay, um, in the middle of the night, all of a sudden, my TV goes on, like full blast. Peppa the pig is playing, okay? <laughs> and I'm like walking down the hall, I'm like trying to figure out what time it is, you know, and I'm like, I'm stumbling everywhere, I don't know what's going on, you know? And I'm standing there in my living room trying to make sense of what's happening, like, why is Peppa the pig blasting, you know? I, I still to this day, I have no idea what happened, but I blame it on Alexa because she's the only one out there awake, okay? And she, I think she did it, but like it took me a minute, okay? And I'm out there and I'm like, I'm thinking, well, and, and, and then I got frightened because I'm like, what if a criminal came in and like turned on my, no, that doesn't make sense, okay? So then I just went back to bed. But it was just this moment where I'm like trying to figure it all out. It was just weird. And that's what, that's what Peter's doing here. So he's, he's led out of the prison and, and the gates open. Verse number 10 says this, when they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of his own accord, kind of like an automatic gate. And they went out and passed one through, uh, on, on one through, on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. Okay, so this is, this is kind of a funny picture too, because Peter, he's out there, and he's waking up, and he's in the middle of the street by himself. Okay, and it says this, and Peter, when he was come to himself, so that's how we know, that's the moment he woke up. That's the moment he's like, whoa, what am I doing out here, okay? That's the moment he realizes this is not just a dream or a sleepwalk. This is like, he's, he's out here, he, he had come to himself. He said, now I know, surety, that the Lord has sent this angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. I love this because you can oppose God, but you cannot stop God. You cannot delay God. And here in this moment, Peter recognizes rightly what happened. God gets the glory. In that moment of recognition, he's like, God did this. And he said he even defied the expectation of the people. And I, lo I love this because for our church family, listen, we stay in God's word. We keep telling people about Christ. We do what God commands us to do. And, and listen, it'll defy the expectation of those around us. It'll defy the expectation of those who would love to see a ministry like this fail. You can oppose God. You, you can defy him, but you cannot stop or delay his purposes. Verse number 12 says this, And when they had considered this, uh, the thing, and when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where they were gathered together praying. And Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel, came to hearken named Rhoda, meaning Rose. This girl's name was Rose. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told Peter, uh, told how Peter stood before the gate. So this is comical. Maybe you've heard this story before. So Rose comes to the gate. Peter's out there. He's vulnerable now. Everyone knows who Peter is, okay? Um, and, and he's knocking at the door. He wants to come in. Rose comes to the door so excited. It's Peter. She runs back. And Peter's like, no, 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 open the door, you know, and then she goes to tell the believers who are praying that Peter's at the gate, you know, so let's see how they respond, and when they, and they said unto her, thou art mad, so, so Rose, you're crazy, okay, you didn't see Peter, and, and it says that, but she constantly affirmed that it was even so, so she's not going to give up, she knows what she saw, she's like, no, I'm not going to give up, and they say, well, maybe it was an angel, there's this Jewish tradition custom that they thought that everyone had a a guardian angel who bore their resemblance. So there may be, maybe it's a ghost, maybe it's an angel, but you didn't see Peter. And, and this is what's interesting to me, is that they were fervent in their prayers. See, even, even the Greek word there, when it says that they made prayers, they, they make prayers, it, they were fervent in their prayers. But their faith was lacking. So they were fervent, but their faith was lacking. Listen, and they missed the miracle. They were exhausted. They were depleted. They were doing the right thing, but they missed it. I think there's a lesson for us as a church family. Listen, we can be, we can be doing the right thing, and we can be exhausted and complete, depleted, and, and we could potentially miss the miracle if we're not expecting it, if we're not looking for it. And so here's the church. Here's the church. They're gathered. They're praying. They are praying for Peter to be released. Peter is released, and they miss it. They miss out on it. They're praying fervently, and, but their faith was lacking. Um, we shouldn't be too hard on them, mainly because Scripture is not too hard on them, and I think there's a big possibility that we would do the same thing. Um, they're praying, I do believe they're praying in faith. I, I think one of the, maybe the best ways to illustrate it is in Mark chapter 9. Uh, Jesus is talking to a dad whose son is possessed by a demon, and he says, and, and, and um, the man says to Jesus, Jesus, 
uh, he says, if thou, uh, Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believe it. So that's what Jesus says to this dad. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. But then he said, help thou my unbelief. I think that's maybe a little bit about what's going on here. I believe that they were gathered together, they were praying, they were praying in faith. And I believe that God was pleased with that. But I think even in this moment, it's like, Lord, help my unbelief. They're tired, they're praying through the night. Maybe they were praying for that, but they weren't expecting God to answer in that way. And they, and they, missed, they missed it. Lord, help my, help my unbelief. But now, now Peter's there, and, and, uh, and, and by the way, God will accomplish his will uh, in spite of us, not because of us. And so even, even though their faith may have been lacking, God still did what he was going to do. I believe God was pleased with their faith, uh, but God will accomplish what he's going to do, and we get to partner with him in that endeavor through prayer. Um, but the fact that their faith was maybe not as entire, maybe it was a little bit lacking, God still worked and God still moved. God was honored by that. In verse number 16, it says, but Peter continued knocking. So meanwhile, Peter's out there still knocking, right? He just got out of prison, doesn't want to go back. And when they'd opened the door, they saw him, and they were astonished. I mean, this is what they're praying for, and they are astonished. And, and, and really, in all this, God receives the glory. Look at verse number 17. It says, but he, beckoning unto them with a hand to hold their peace, like, shh, shh. they get all excited. And he's like, no, 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 you're going to wake up everyone. Let's go inside. They're like, Peter. And she, he's like, shh. You know, and they go back inside. And he declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. See, God gets the glory in this. See, and God's glory is unrivaled, and he'll do what he chooses to do. And he's good enough and gracious enough to involve us in the process. But in the end, God gets the glory for all of it. And Peter knew that. Verse number 18 is, and, and this, is, this is interesting, 18 and verse 19 talks about how there was no small stir, Luke wrote. No, that means there was, a, there was a big stir, okay? Because Peter was loose the next day. Herod takes the lives of the guards. He's again frustrated because Jane, Peter has escaped, escaped from prison. And so he goes down to Caesarea, and there he abode, verse number 19 tells us. So Herod is livid. He's upset. The life of the guards are immediately taken. Herod's mad, so he goes down to Caesarea. And I showed you a picture of Caesarea a little bit ago. It's the seaport city, and he's going to go there, and he's going to kind of cool off. He's also got a big meeting there, and we'll, we'll read about this in just a second. Uh, but I want you to understand this, and we're almost done, that God's going to have the last word. Uh, one of the things that we can think about on Mother's Day is that, have you ever noticed that moms have the last word? Mom, like, whatever mom says, that goes, right? Moms get the last word. I remember, and I'm, I'm ashamed to admit this, but I remember being in an argument with my brother when I was in, in college, and he was in high school. And I walked, it was a Sunday afternoon, and I walked into uh, my bedroom at home, and I see Matt, my brother, wearing my favorite shirt. Okay, I don't know where I got this shirt, but it had my initials on it, and I thought that was pretty cool, you know? And he's wearing, I'm like, Matt, that's my shirt. Those are my initials, okay? Obviously, it's my shirt, you know? And I'm like, take it off, that's a nice shirt. And he's like, no. And I'm like, Matt, seriously, you have other shirts, take off the shirt right now. And he's like, no, you know, defiant, younger, rebellious brother. I'm like, no, take, take off the shirt right now. I'm, I'm being stern with him, okay? We didn't really have a lot of fights growing up, but we were, we were about to have one, okay? And so um, I'm like, Matt, take off the shirt right now. So he goes, no. And he goes, in fact, you're wearing my tie. And I'm like, oh, man, yep. <laughs> So I'm wearing his tie. But at this point, I don't care. He doesn't care. I'm like, Matt, take off the shirt. So I'm now I'm like, I'll take this shirt off of you. So I'm going, I'm ripping the buttons to my own prized shirt as I'm trying to take off the shirt. And he's, he's taking the tie, and he's tightening it around my neck. <laughs> he's trying to end my life, you know? And I'm so frustrated. My shirt's ripped. This tie is all the way up around my neck. So finally, I'm like, I'm leaving. Now, I was Matt's ride to church. This is a Sunday afternoon. It's time to go to church. I'm Matt's ride to church. So I'm like, you know what, Matt? Find your own ride to church. And I went and got in my car, and I'm driving to church. I, I peeled out of my uh, parents' driveway, and I'm driving to church. And I'm all frustrated and mad at my brother Matt, and my phone rings. It's my mom. <laughs> and she goes, Larry, you turn around right now and go pick Matt up. I'm like, yes, ma'am. Hung it up. I was so frustrated. You know why? 
because Matt had called my mom, and he knew my mom gets the last word. There's nothing I can do about it, you know? It's, it's done. It's written in stone. I have to go pick him up now. So the Lord gave me this brilliant thought as I was driving home that my mom didn't say where on the property I should drop him off at. She just said drive him to church, and I know where the property starts. So I drove him to the church property, and uh, I, I opened the door and let him out right at the corner, <laughs> right at the corner by the sign. He got out and slammed the door, and, 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 and we, we resolved that later. But the one thing I learned was moms always get the last word, right? Well, we're going to see in this passage, and we're done, that God gets the last word because Herod's so defiant, and he's, he's vexing angry against the church, and he goes down to this seaport city. And Herod, at this time, and he's down there uh, probably for the occasion, uh, Josephus, the historian, wrote about this very same event. And he said it was, it was most likely Claudius' birthday, and there was a Phoenician delegation there, so Herod's there. And Herod, verse number 20, is highly displeased with, uh, with them of Tyre and Sidon. We saw the map earlier in the service to the north. But they came with one accord to him, saying, and having made blast of the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. So they, this, this delegation comes from Tyre and Sidon. They come to Herod. They've got ulterior modems. They don't want war. They come to Herod, and they're going to be really nice to him because they want peace. And it says this in verse number 21. And upon a set day, this is just a few days after Peter escapes from prison, Herod, arrayed in a royal apparel, sat on the throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a god and not of a man. So Herod makes this speech. The delegation really likes it, or they're just wanting Herod to think that they really like it. Remember how Herod likes the approval of man? They're applauding and saying, man, that... That's an awesome speech. The voice we just heard, and he was, by the way, he was probably clothed in fine gold and silver on the seacoast there. He would, he would have sparkled and shone. And everyone there in the delegation was like, man, this is, this is the voice of not a man. This is a voice of a God. And it says in verse number 23, And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not the glo- God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. That's a nice Mother's Day verse, huh? (laughs) Acts chapter number 17 says this. Paul was preaching in Athens. He said, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of our own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Verse number 30 says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. God is a sovereign God. God is in control. God was in control of Herod every moment he was king. But at this moment, there had been things that Herod had done that God had permitted and God had winked at. But in this moment, God says, no, this is a moment of judgment. Herod crosses this line. He takes the glory that rightfully belonged to God. He did not give God the glory, and immediately his life was ended. I think it's interesting that word uh, smote is patazo. It means to tap or to strike. It could be a little tap or it could be a a mean strike. It all depends on the context. That word smote, it's the same word when the angel smote Peter. Maybe even the same angel who smote Herod smote Peter. Same word, different response. So Peter, he was smitten and he awoke and was freed. Herod, he was smitten perhaps by the same angel, and his life ends. You see, God is control. God is sovereign. And God will accomplish what he's going to accomplish with or without us. He will always have the last word. Isaiah says this, Even everyone that is called by my name, for my name, called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. We, we get to come to a church where God is working and God is doing some amazing things. And one of the things that I hear often, I love hearing, is to God be the glory. Praise the Lord. And I don't think we can do that enough because he deserves all the glory and all the credit. So Herod's a wicked king and he didn't give God the glory, but what about when we do something that we think is good? Uh, what about the times where we rob from God's glory, where, where, where we do th- something and we think, we, yeah, I did this, or I accomplished this, or yeah, I gave that, or we built that. Listen, the glory belongs to God, and he deserves it, and in the end, he will get it. There was a game a few years ago, Utah versus Oregon. It was a football game. Utah 
uh, had an early 7 to nothing lead, and there's a pass thrown, and I wrote, I, I wrote down the receiver. I thought I wrote down the receiver's name. Uh, Kalen Clay, I think it was a receiver, and he catches the ball, and he runs it in for a touchdown. It was a, it was a huge pass, a huge touchdown, and he gets to the very end of the end zone, and he goes to do an end zone uh, celebration in the end zone, but something interesting happens. He dropped the ball at the one-yard line, and even he didn't realize when he dropped the ball. So he runs a, a massive catch and runs all the way, and he gets right there, and he drops the ball, and it touches right outside of the end zone. And he's in the end zone flexing and doing his celebration. And meanwhile, another player from the other team picked up the ball, ran it back 99 yards for a touchdown. Here's this guy in, in the press conference. He was, he, was, he was very humbled, understandably, in the press conference. He said, I blew it. Uh, but man, how sad would it be if we blew it? Where, where God's given us so many great things, we get to come to attend and minister in a place where God's accomplishing some amazing things. How tragic would it be if, if we blew it at the one-yard line because we didn't give God the glory? See, God's going to get it. The gospel is going to advance. God includes us on his work, but he gets the glory and deserves the glory. Verse number 24 says this, and we're done. But the word of God grew and multiplied. I love it because at the beginning of the passage, it, things look very dim for the church. James is killed. Peter's in prison. Things look very dark. But at the end of the passage, passage, because God works, the Word of God not only grows, but it multiplies. God continues His work. And, and the same promise is true to us. The promise that He will build His church, and He includes us in on that promise. But we must be, must strive to give God the glory for all that he has done. Let's pray.